Danny Cherry is a consultant with uh, over a decade of experience with platforms such as Microsoft SQL Server, Hyper-V, vSphere, and Enterprise Storage Solutions. Danny's area of technical expertise include system architecture, performance tuning, security, replication, and troubleshooting. Danny currently holds several of the Microsoft certification related to SQL Server for version 2003-2014, including the Microsoft Certified Master as well. And also, Danny has written several books and dozens of technical articles on SQL Server management and how SQL Server integrates with various other technologies. Well, uh, welcome, Danny. Uh, and my first question is, uh, what makes SQL Server exciting and why are you so passionate about data? Uh, so thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I love working with data. I, I always have. I'm kind of weird that way. I mean, SQL Server is a really interesting product because it's such a wide product and covers so many parts of this data platform thing that we that we know of now. You know, it, it started as just kind of a database engine with SQL Agent, and that was basically it. And then, you know, slowly new features were introduced, and we got into the BI space and with analysis services, and then eventually reporting services were added onto it. The fact that it's grown up kind of with my IT career is probably one of the reasons that I really like working with it. Because, you know, when I started out, I started out kind of on SQL 6.5 and SQL 7, and I've really seen the product grow over time, and, and you know, my career has grown around along with it. You know, as we've gone from just a basic that mm -hmm. data storage engine to this this much bigger, much wider product that can do do a lot more and handle much much larger workloads than we ever imagined. You know, back in the in the SQL Server seven days. Wow! And you also mentioned something about Hyper-V. Uh, what is that, and how is it applicable with a uh, SQL Server technology? Hyper-V is uh, Microsoft's hyper hypervisor platform. Um, so if you're familiar with VMware on the mm -hmm. hypervisor side of things, um, you know that's this is Microsoft's competitor to that. Okay. Uh, so it, it runs all the all the, the hypervisors that are, all the platforms that, that people are running where they're running Windows on the on the bare metal and mm -hmm. running virtual machines inside that running SQL Server. I'm curious these days, big data analytics and they're getting a lot of uh, attention. Have you ha worked with either big data analytics either on-prem or Microsoft SQL Server, uh, SQL Azure Cloud environment? Yeah, so I mean, there's the, the whole big data thing has definitely been exploding over the last couple of years. It, it's really gone from something almost nobody had ever heard of to kind of a buzzword that gets way overused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we, we at Dennis and Associates Consulting, you know, we, we've definitely done a lot of big data projects, mm -hmm. um, both on-prem and kind of just the, the more traditional large data warehouse sense of it with the reporting built on top of that. And then more recently, we've done a lot of work in Azure uh, with SQL Data Warehouse. We've done some work with Hadoop, uh, with HD Insight. Uh, we've, done, we've done some work with Azure Data Factory to, to transform that data into, you know, into these, these various solutions so that we can get Power BI then built on top of it, either on-prem using the, the on-prem gateway or just direct in, through the cloud platforms. Um, to really get the visualizations there that people are looking for, so they can you know make make those intelligent decisions and figure out how or not necessarily how more what all this information that's in their systems means um, and how they can then use it to to make decisions and and then do things. One of the guys on the team, uh, he's actually been working on a project right now using Azure or sorry using Azure SQL Data Warehouse combined with SSIS combined with SQL Database with then the Power BI on top of it to do some reporting for one of our clients so they can then deliver those reports to their clients mm -hmm. uh, through Power BI Embedded Edition uh, so that their end users who are uh, government agencies can then visualize the data and slice and dice that information and see kind of where all the money is getting spent on these various projects. Um, so it's, it's been really interesting to kind of see this whole thing evolve, um, especially on the Azure side from something that didn't really exist a few years ago into, into something much more interesting today. I was thinking with uh, uh, SQL Azure and their Power BI, uh, what do you call, how they integrated Power BI with their uh, SQL Azure Data Warehouse deployment. Mm -hmm. Compared to other tools, like uh, how well uh, do you find it um, when it comes to deployment and presenting for your users? Do you find it user-friendly enough or uh, useful uh, that gives them more value out of it? Deploying as Power BI with, with SQL Database, SQL Data Warehouse, it, it's an incredibly easy solution to deploy because uh, it doesn't really require a whole lot of IT infrastructure knowledge to do. Um, it's just a matter of getting those things up and running, uh, which is usually just a few clicks. Mm -hmm. 
and then you've got access to that platform, and then it's just a matter of getting the data into that various you know, those various solutions. That's really the harder part is is migrating the data, migrating the application from you know a legacy platform into this more cloud based platform, so that people can then easily build build these databases on top of it. Um, I, I've built a couple of Power BI databases, your Power BI dashboards, really fast um, to track data. Uh, for example, if, you know who's posting into the SQL Help hashtag on Twitter. I built the Power BI dashboard on top of that, it's just because it was easy data to go get. That you know, and it really let me see just how easy it was to get all this set up as somebody who doesn't do Power BI on a day-to-day -day basis, because that's not what I specialize in. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to be able to see that and see just how quick and easy it was um, to get that all working and be able to share that dashboard with some of my colleagues and, and get things working. I noticed you've been a consultant for a long time. My question is, do you think going through consulting project and facing the challenges and difficulties are worth it? Or uh, on, on top of that, what difficulties did you face initially uh, when you started as a consultant? The biggest difficulty going into consulting is finding those first clients because you don't really have a reputation you can draw on you know, as a consultant, which you know, I do now. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that's that's probably the hardest part. You know, it's it's definitely been a rewarding experience going into consulting. It's definitely different from having a normal job, um, especially the way we've been structuring our business, because um, we, we're not kind of the normal consulting shop where we only do projects. We also do kind of DBA as a service style stuff for for customers. Um, so you know, for a lot of our customers, we are their DBA. You know, we, we just don't do it full time for that one customer. Um, we've got a lot of customers who are with their DBA for a couple of days a week or a couple of days a month, and that gives us the flexibility of working on various things and gives them the ability to have a DBA without having to hire you know, a full-time DBA when they don't need a full-time person. We do definitely do a lot of interesting projects, which is one of the really cool things about being a consultant. That said, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. The hours can be pretty grueling sometimes. This is a, it's definitely a rewarding career, a rewarding job being a consultant. It's definitely not for everybody. It doesn't come with the stability of a nine to five necessarily. I mean, it does. We're a company. We we make payroll every month like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But I don't know necessarily what I'm doing month to month or week to week. Mm -hmm. You know, this week I'm, I'm working on one project. Next week I'm working on a totally different project. So you have to be able to jump from project to project very, very quickly and very, very easily. Mm -hmm. As well as obviously be a self starter because you know, as as we all work from home here, you know, we watch, you know, watch our over our shoulders, making sure everything's going. So you got to be willing to go, hey, I need help, and reach out to somebody else on the team and go, hey, I'm working on this for this client. What am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, everybody we have is really good about doing that sort of thing. Okay. The flip side is it's really cool because we do get to do all these different kinds of projects because mm -hmm. we are jumping from project to project. Um, and I'm working like three or four different projects right now that are all totally different. And you know, on a normal job, you typically wouldn't get to do that, at least not very often. Whereas as a consultant, you know, we kind of get to do that all the time. So, you know, that's kind of a cool thing about doing this. You know, one of the demoralizing thing about consulting could be is that this uncertainty factor and you don't know whether you'll get any job or project lined up right after one you're currently work on. And it's this uncertainty and not knowing uh, what will happen in future. I mean, how do you, you know, inspire yourself to think positively that uh, you're going to make it? Um, yeah, so I mean, there is there is definitely uncertainty from from not knowing kind of what's coming next. But on the flip side of that, we keep ourselves booked out fairly well in advance. So even if somebody does cancel or if there is a couple weeks off or something like that, it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. And as a company, you know, we keep money in the bank to make payroll and all that good stuff. So you know, we we have to think about that as we hire people: is how much you know, how much cash on hand do we need to keep? before things we start getting worried about things. That's all businessy stuff though, not technical, you know, not technical problems. Mm -hmm. As the business owner, that's that's my job to worry about. The everybody that works everybody else that works for the company doesn't have to worry about that stuff. They you know, they, they have the leisure of just collecting a paycheck and not have to worry about that. That's right. On um, on the flip side, we've been very lucky. We have a pile of work that comes in. We just hired somebody recently and you know, obviously, the reason we did that is because we had enough work to justify that the additional expense of having another person. But we've been very careful about how we've grown because of that, because we don't want to overextend. We don't want to get into the position where we might have to lay somebody off. We're, we'd much rather grow conservatively 
and uh, and take things slow and make sure that we don't overextend ourselves and get ourselves into a bad situation. Mm-hmm. So in your career, what has been the most important and high impactful project re- as it relates to either SQL Server, Big Data, or any latest data trend, uh, data related technology? The most high impact project I ever did. Was, mm-hmm. I mean, I've done a few. <laughs> to be to be honest. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest ones that I've probably done was back. I'm trying to. I can, I've got a few. I've got a lot of stories I can tell. Been doing this a while at this point. All right. Um, so let's see. We'll start. We'll start. We'll go chronologically. Okay. So back in uh, 2001, mm-hmm. I was working for a company. I was working for a video game company, uh, and I somehow was the guy managing the advertising system because it had a large database attached to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as part of that system. We had set up log shipping from one server to another. This was obviously a big money maker for us uh, because it was the ads. All the ads for the websites and all the ads that were shown in game in, in most of the video games on the planet at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that system would fail. The database server would fail about every 18 months because the hard drives would fail. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before I started working there, they lost about a week's worth of data. Uh, when the hard wow. drives failed. While I worked there, the hard drives failed, and we lost two and a half minutes worth of data. So the financial impact to the company was extremely small. It was small enough that they emailed all the advertisers and said, hey, we don't know what ads played for these two minutes. Um, we're not going to charge anybody for the ads that were playing during these two minutes. It just wasn't worth the time to figure out how much everybody owed us on average mm-hmm. to to bother billing them for it. All right, the next big thing I did would have been back in like 06, right after, or 05, right after SQL 2005 came out. I was working for an auto finance company at the time, uh, and we upgraded our loan origination system, which did about a billion and a half dollars a year in in car loans, uh, and our average loan was like eight thousand dollars. We upgraded that to SQL 2005 from SQL 2000. I want to say two months after SQL 2005 was released. Mm-hmm. So we, we did a hardware upgrade at, at the same time and, and did the software upgrade as part of that. So I think the, the, the oh, single file was released in February. We were in production by mid-April. After we, we told the business they could start playing with the system, but not to let new customer data in and not to change any data because if we wanted to roll back, we didn't have to redo anything. Uh, we got a phone call about 20 minutes later saying that they didn't care what it took. We were going to stay on this version of SQL, we're going to stay on this new hardware. That's how happy they were with the performance um, after the upgrade. So we worked a long night that night, dealt with some firewall problems, and uh, and got them up and running, and kept everything up and running on that version, because rollback was not an option at that point. The, the business has said, we don't care what it takes, we don't care what it costs, keep us on this version. Probably the other cool thing that I've ever had happen to me was uh, I was doing some work for a client and we were just doing basic performance changes, index tuning on a server. It was a SQL 2000 box. And uh, the next morning when the, when the business unit came in, they actually complimented the IT director without prompting because of how much faster and how much better the system was performing. Wow. I think I've had that happen exactly one time in my entire 20-year career, uh, and that was the one time. And I'm very happy that client called me and told me that that happened. But, yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, and that was, I mean, that was just a normal performance tuning gig. I was there for a weekend, and then Monday morning when they came in, they were all very, very happy. Yeah, those are, those are probably the big three that I can think of. Stuff. And I'm sure I've done new stuff. There's stuff more recently than that. Yeah, yeah that's, it's really that's wonderful when that. clients approach you and tell you about the good work you do, and it just yeah. makes it a lot worth it. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's nice to say they don't hate you and they're happy that they got that's your right. voice. That's right. Like, you're not taking all of our money. <laughs> right. You're also a Microsoft certified master. Like, what does it mean, and how did you how did you go about achieving it? Uh, so, Microsoft certified master program was built by Microsoft back in the SQL 2008 days, and it was actually killed off uh, in the SQL 2012 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, it was designed to be kind of the Microsoft equivalent to the Oracle certified master or the CCIE, uh, sorry, Cisco certification. So it's supposed to be the top tier, top echelon consultants and, and people working with the product. It started as what was called the Ranger program. Uh, so that was an internal Microsoft program. You had to be a Microsoft employee to go through it. It basically started with three weeks of intensive training and then tests to make sure that you actually understood the material and, and got it. 
Uh, so that turned into the Certified Master Program for SQL 2008, which they opened to the general to the public. Um, it was very expensive mm -hmm. because you had to go on prem to, to Microsoft for three weeks in Redmond. So that meant three weeks of not billing clients. <laughs> As a consultant, that's very expensive to do. Yes. <laughs> um, plus, you had to pay for hotel, food, and then the training was like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, a, a U.S. based consultant could easily be looking at fifty thousand dollars of, of hit mm -hmm. to just to take part in this, with no guarantee that you'd pass the exams. So, so you had to pay that, for that it. The they were not paying you for it. Um, so when I did it, I actually took it after they made it so you no longer had to go take the classes. Okay. So all I did was take the tests. Oh, nice. <laughs> so it was significantly cheaper because mm -hmm. I didn't have to go up there for three weeks and I didn't have to pay for the tests. So when I took it, it was about, I think it cost $3,000 total wow. to, take the, to take the two exams, $500 for the knowledge exam. Uh, and then I think two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars for the for the lab. Once you got through that, you were then a, a certified master. So, um, it is probably the hardest certification exam. I mean, mm -hmm. it is the hardest certification exam I've ever taken on SQL Server. Does that uh, let you uh, like give you the authority to train others in Microsoft technology? Is that what it is for? Uh, no, so it's it's not. It doesn't give you the, the ability to train. Um, I mean, anybody can train, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, the the certified master. It's it's simply a designation that you know the product really, really well. Okay. Um, so you know, there's there's the the Microsoft Certified Solutions Associate, Microsoft Certified Solutions Engineer, and the MCSA and the MCSE that are out right now. Mm -hmm. So this would be the next step above those. Oh, okay. Uh, so if somebody. Master. Yeah, so if somebody got through all those uh, BI de uh, developer or SQL DBA track using those exams like 7461, it is after those level you take MCM. Yeah, it would. Yeah, if if it still existed, mm -hmm. it would be higher. It would be that next level up. Oh, okay. Um, but unfortunately, it does not exist anymore. Okay, that sounds like a good deal, right? Yeah, I mean, for newer people. Cool. I mean, there, yeah, there there are only <laughs> about. 350 certified masters for mm -hmm. SQL Server in the world. Wow. Um, and I'm one of them. Oh. Um, so it's, it's a really small club, mm -hmm. and most of the people that are certified masters work yep. for Microsoft. Belated um, congratulations, so I say. Outside, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Of the people you know, who are outside of SQL, or outside of Microsoft, I'm, I'm one of the few mm -hmm. that's a certified master. Nice. Uh, one question. Um, uh, Sometimes I, uh, I try to mentor younger developers, DDB, DBA, uh, who wants to move into this field, what would you tell them to do Like, uh, if they want to get into the SQL Server database world? What, what advice do you have for them? First piece of advice I give to everybody who's trying to get into IT, keep learning. Never assume that you know everything about whatever it is you're working on. When it comes to trying to get into the, the database field specifically, don't set a goal of where you want to work. Instead, try all of it. There's lots of different pieces of it. Try it all if you can and see which piece of it you like best, which one excites you the most, mm -hmm. and focus on that. That will give you the most success in your career. I got lucky and felt able to do that and fall into that fairly early in my career. Not everybody is as lucky as I am, obviously. But if you can find a part of it that you enjoy working in, it will make it much, much easier to, to excel at your career. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say excel at your career tends to come with more money. Um, <laughs> since that's one of the reasons we do all of this, you know, is you know to get paid to pay the mortgage. Um, that's right. More money comes in handy. When it comes to SQL Server 2016, what are some of your most favorite new things or uh, pain points in, in in this new RDBMS? SQL 2016 has a lot of enhancements, not too many new features, but a lot of improvements to, to existing features. Okay. It was, it was a really big release, but for the most part, it was an, an enhancement release. So I mean, there was a lot of work done in the column store to make it faster. There were a lot of improvements to always, avail, always on availability groups to make them faster uh, so that we can support you know, higher workloads, bigger workloads in the availability groups. Um, there's a lot of encryption work that was done, or a lot of security work rather that was done um, with things like always encrypted and a real level security to, to help protect data. So I mean, there, there's just a lot of new, a lot of enhancements. I can't want to say, 
some of it's new, some of it's not. It's, it's this weird mishmash of of new features uh, and and uh, existing features. Mm -hmm. there, there's just been a, a a lot of work across the board just to kind of enhance everything, mm -hmm. which has been been really nice for the for the product. We you know, kind of see a lot of, a lot of new features coming out in a there are a lot of enhancements in a lot of various places. Mm -hmm. When it comes to like uh, artificial intelligence on Microsoft side of the world, you know, like how um, Google has their TensorFlow uh, environment and um, other people use uh, R technology or Python to implement their uh, own version of solutions when it comes to AI related problem. Um, I noticed that uh, there is when, um, Azure machine learning environment. Have you played around with that? Mm -hmm. I've played around a very, very little bit with the Azure Machine Learning. It did some really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, I think with sentiment analysis was really cool. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be really handy for businesses. So like you can you can feed Twitter through it mm -hmm. and find out if people are tweeting you in a positive way or a negative way. Yeah. Um, recently, there was all the problems that United was having, uh, United Airlines was having, um, mm -hmm. so they could have easily fed you know, their Twitter feed through the sentiment analysis and, and probably found out earlier that there was a, a problem they needed to address. Wow. And as they were releasing announcements about it, you know, they could watch what those Twitter feeds were doing if they were watching that sentiment analysis, for example. And they could then see, okay, things are not going our way. We need to change tactics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, that's some of the really cool things that you can do with all that. And it's fairly easy to get that spun up fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, without a huge amount of technical knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to get most of that stuff up and running pretty quickly, and you know, it's it's really interesting to be able to, to, be able to see all that, and, and then the all the various cognitive services and the machine learning features, um, the R integration in SQL Server directly is is fantastic. Mm -hmm. and the fact that data scientists can can write R queries in T SQL. You know, as part of their T-SQL code mm -hmm. uh, and do R as, you know, as part of that process uh, is really interesting. One of our clients is actually doing that right now in the real estate business with, with real estate data. And uh, so they're getting some really good results uh, by running, they're running R in, inside a SQL server. Uh, so they, you know, they can manipulate the data with T-SQL and they can run R scripts against it to get whatever magic numbers they're trying to get out of it. And then they do, can, Use T-SQL as the next command, and do some more work with it, and then run another R script against it. Um, and you know, if they batch that workout correctly, they can they can really process all of that data extremely fast. Um, I mean, they're, they're processing billions of rows, doing valuations on these on these on these rows, you know, thousands of times a minute. So they're they're processing everything in days instead of months, which is just fantastic. One of the things I really uh, liked about uh, Azure Machine Learning was that uh, the interface is so similar to SSIS, and you, uh, I mean, I don't know, you, you pretty much get a giggle because if you want to do something uh, similar, uh, kind of experiment with R and Python, it'd be so much challenging, uh, whereas they just mm -hmm. make it into a drag and drop type problem, as long as you know how to you know, uh, as long as you know what kind of problem to solve and how to uh, plug in those modules, uh, you can easily roll out a, a data science solution in machine learning studio over there. Yeah, there, I mean, there's lots of ways to build machine learning solutions. There, mm -hmm. There's no one right way. Yep. Um, that's probably a good piece of advice for people that are just trying to get into this industry. Is that's true. There yep. is no one right way to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of options, mm -hmm. and depending on what you're trying to do, you know, that's going to change which option is going to be the best solution for you. So, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of things that to, to keep in mind when looking at these solutions. I know this confuses a lot of people and throws a lot of people off when they're first getting into IT because they think, oh, well, you know, this is, you know, way X or process X is how you always do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well... Sometimes, you know, sometimes process Y is the right way to do it. Sometimes process Z is the right way to do it. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of different lots of different ways of getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of which variables you're using, yep. you know, as part of your workflow analysis to decide which one is the right one to go. Mm -hmm. And some of that just comes with experience, and some of that comes with uh, just trial and error to to figure out which one's the right one. Do you have any cool SQL Server? tips or trick that you can uh, teach me and my audience 
Um, keep an open mind as to what what's going on. Um, you know, like Stanko was just talking about, never never assume that way X is the way that things should be done. Mm-hmm. Um, this is especially true when like playing with indexes and stuff like that. Um, the other the other thing I I, I find that, that helps a lot with, with dealing with SQL Server is learn what SQL Server wants to do. Don't assume that SQL Server is going to do things the way you think they should be done. You know, this is especially true when, like, when you're looking at indexes and stuff like that. You know, it's SQL Server is going to do things the way it wants to do, whether you like them or not. So, when when looking at and tuning things, you need to focus on making sure that it can do what it wants to do as fast as possible, not that it's going to do things the way you think it should. I've had a lot of arguments with people going, well, SQL Server should do it this way. I'm like, well, it maybe it should, but it doesn't. So you have to work with the system the way it's built. It's just a database engine. On the flip side, it's a very expensive database engine. Microsoft does spend a lot of money making it and enhancing it. So, you know, it, it, it does things certain ways for certain reasons. And once you start to, to figure out what those reasons are, and, and wrap your brain around the, the, the what it's doing and, and get a little background knowledge on the why it's doing it that way, things get a lot easier to work with very, very quickly, I've discovered. You can, you can start to see kind of what's going on in the background and mm-hmm. why it's doing what it's doing. And, you know, it thing, weird things that it starts to do start to make a little more sense sometimes, okay. <laughs> not all the time. Where do you think uh, SQL Server uh, will trend toward in a few years, and uh, when is the next version of SQL Server coming out? Do you know any details about that? Uh, so I don't know any details about when the next version of SQL is coming out. I know it's going to be soon. <laughs> All right. It's going to be sometime this year, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Obviously, SQL Server on Linux is going to be a huge thing. Um, so right now it's April, mid mid-ish April. So we've got CTP ones come out. Uh, CTP two has not yet dropped. The year is still young. We've, we've got eight months to go, that's plenty of time to get a couple more CTPs mm-hmm. out the door, uh, as well as a technical preview. So there's still plenty of time. So I, I would imagine it's going to drop sometime this year. What's coming? Who knows? Is that CTP for SQL Server V next? Yeah, this is the CTP for, for V next. Um, Microsoft released it eh, a couple months ago. Okay, so, um, so it will be a success to okay, the SQL 2016, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the whatever's whatever's coming after 2016. Okay, Mr. Danny, uh, I enjoyed chatting with you. Uh, thank you for uh, spending significant amount of your time. And I'm curious uh, if somebody wants to connect with you, either LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. What are some places can they find out about you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty much everywhere. Uh, so on Twitter, my username is Mr. Denny, M R D E N N Y. Uh, but the company's Twitter handle is DCACCO, same as our website. Mm-hmm. Uh, so speaking of that, our company website is uh, www.dcac.co. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can hit me up on Facebook. Uh, I think it's facebook.com slash DCAC, I think. Okay. I honestly, don't, I honestly don't know what the company's Facebook is. Okay. Uh, and then you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, in, you can find me or the company there and get in touch with me through, through either one of those.